Christopher Media. Let's make some noise. Dear people of Aboriginal background of <laughs> Australia. Prepare to be offended. We apologize in advance for our uh, horrible pronunciations of your name. Do not, do not take offense. Long, long time ago, ten of us men went on the swamp to hunt the eggs of Kumang, the magpie goose. This young one was thinking wrong thoughts. So this old fella tell him a story. A story before a long time ago. Before we can remember. <laughs> this story has too many wives. But not enough women. There's war in this story and sorcery. And the belly is big as a mountain. There's wrong love and there's wrong revenge. I love you. I love you. Maybe it's a bad ending. Maybe it's a good one. It's not like your story. It's my story. My story you've never seen before. Welcome to the Projection Booth. I'm your host, Mike White. Joining me is my co-host, Mr. Rob St. Mary. This is my story. It's not your story. Also back with us this week is Mr. Miguel Rodriguez. But it is a pretty good story all the same. This week we are talking about the 2006 Australian film Ten Canoes. Directed by Ralph Daher, this film is a multi-level tale of Aboriginal Australians. It's a story about stories. Proper stories. Proper stories that help people live the proper way. I am purposefully leaving this a bit vague, as we'll be getting more into the story as we go along. But first, Miguel, as our guest, when was the first time you saw Ten Canoes, and what did you think? Oh, gosh. Um, I think I actually, you know, we were talking about Baltimore earlier. I believe I saw Ten Canoes at the Charles Theater in Baltimore, Maryland, Probably the year it came out, so I think that was, what, 06? I, I just got off my festival, so I didn't do all the research I should have, <laughs> other than rewatching the film. I think this film is amazing. I, I really, really think, find it a, an exceptional journey. So uh, I, thought it, I thought it then, and I, and I think it even more now after rewatching it. I had never seen this. As a matter of fact, outside of Bad Boy Bubby, which was Rolf DeHare's film that we talked about on the Baby, Baby, Baby episode, I was not familiar with this filmmaker. So you really can't get uh, further away from the other film. I mean, Ten Canoes looks like, uh, in in terms of story and ideas, was made by someone completely different uh, than what you would expect for this other film that was about a guy who's you know, kind of wandering around – Originally, you think sort of a post-apocalyptic world in uh, Bad Boy Bubby, and then you realize he's dealing with the modern world and all of sort of being out of step with it. I was quite impressed, and it's one that I'd like to go back and watch again because I don't know about you guys, but I kind of feel that at times whenever we're presented with people who are native or aboriginal or first nations, however you want to do it, it it often seems like it's a very fine line to tread. And sometimes it ends up being sort of this noble savage idea that though, well, of course they're better than you uh, because they, they live by the ancient ways or it becomes this thing where it's kind of offensive to their culture in a way. So, and I think in here, it's just really kind of straight down the middle and we get a great understanding of, of what that life uh, must have been like and maybe still is. You know, I, I have to jump in there and piggyback off you, Rob, because you, you kind of hit the nail on the head with uh, the way the uh, Aboriginal tribes are depicted here it, uh, regarding whether or not, you know, the noble <laughs> – it's even hard to say noble savage and, or, or, you know, the other way around, the kind of buffoonery or, or clown in the wild. But uh, 
what I find fascinating about Ten Canoes is even though you're looking at a group of people and it's not even like present day aboriginal tribes we're looking at a period piece and it's a layered period piece uh where we're seeing a group of aboriginal tribes back years ago before any westerners went to australia and they're telling a story about their own ancestors from years even before that uh so it's not just aboriginal tribes it's aboriginal tribes from x number of years ago but all that being said what we're presented with, the way they behave, the things that they care about, the way that they interact with each other, it's extremely relatable and familiar. I mean, they're you know, making fun of the, the guy who farts and they <laughs> are talking about women and, and it's all just kind of very human. And uh, I think that's amazing. I think that was fantastically done. I think I saw this one probably 2008, maybe 2009. I had seen uh, Dr. Plonk, which I think I talked about on the Bad Boy Bubby episode as well. And that one just kind of blew me away. And then to find out that this guy who had done Bad Boy Bubby, and there was at least one other one, I think Incident at Raven's Gate, that I had seen before this as well. And then to go back and, and see... Ten Canoes, which I think was streaming on Netflix at the time, just, oh my god, it, it, like you said, Rob, every single film feels like it's done by a different director when it comes to Ralph DeHare's work. Like, the style of it, the look of it, the subject matter of it, I mean, there's very few things that travel from film to film with him, and I think that's fantastic, and you would never know that the guy who did Bad Boy Bubby also did Ten Canoes, because yeah, it does seem like worlds apart though there are some similarities here and there as far as like you know the outsider and all this kind of stuff and i love the storytelling just the the movie is a story about stories and this multi-layered narrative is fantastic and the one thing that i got out of it the more i watch this film the more i realize just how they're reusing some shots from one story to another mm. just to kind of pull things together to say, you know, everything that's happened before is still happening now and is probably going to happen in the future. Because we don't necessarily get a time frame for the outer story, the outer story that David Gopalil is narrating. Because he's telling this story about this tribe, and I don't think we necessarily get exactly when this tribe is there around. And then within that story, there's one guy telling a story to another tribesman, and he sets that tale all the way back at the beginning, all the way back, like just after you know the flood, just after Australia's formed. So kind of a story as old as time kind of thing. And to see that you know people were doing things then that they're still doing today, it's just one of these great ways of you know kind of subtly driving things home when you look at something and you're like, well, that's the same thing that they were doing earlier, and then you realize, oh, that's the exact same shot, just one is in color and one is in black and white. One of the things also with the storytelling device of him doing the voiceover and being the narrator is I got this feeling of like being around a campfire kind of thing. And there's an aspect of it that as I was watching it, I thought, you know, could he have done this without the subtitles? And I think at times it could be done, but I think some of the nuances would have been missed. I was thinking of something like uh, when I saw Malik's The New World, where those who were of the tribe were not subtitled. When they were in conversation with each other and they were not in conversation with the English, you had no idea what they were saying. But you could, in, it was implied, you could understand it based on their interactions among each other. And I was... And I think it would be a different film that way, but I was sort of thinking to myself, it it is such a film that I think, to a certain extent, and the visuals are important, but it's almost with his with his narration that you could just listen to his narration. It's almost like a radio play or something like that for me. Because we have the subtitles, we're invited to be part of the tribe. And that's what separates this film from The New World, uh, Terrence Malick's The New World, 
in Malik's the New World, as as great as Terrence Malik is in that film is, uh, the natives in that film still seemed very much kind of the other, even though you see them interacting with each other, you can kind of uh, discern what they're what they're thinking and how they uh, how they live their lives. You're still apart from them. And I think the one of the points of Ten Canoes was to uh, invite you in and, and make you part of the tribe and experience the things along with them. So I actually do personally like the subtitles. And, you know, there are funny things, the way uh, jokes that they tell each other, the way they rib each other that really only work when you can get some kind of translation for what they're saying rather than just have – uh, David Golpalil n- narrate it. Yeah, like I said, I wasn't advocating for that version <laughs> of the film. I was just saying that if it was done that way, I think I, I, I think it would be still an interesting watch. Oh yeah, that's definitely true. It's it's fascinating. The visuals make it uh, so engaging. So just to kind of carry on what we were talking about with the the layers of storytelling. So we start in color with David Golpalil's voice coming up and being this narrator, and luckily he's kind of to your guys's point he's a very engaging narrator and he is there with us a lot so it's not like you're going through long periods of this film and saying what happened to the narrator this is kind of odd like he's there to walk us through a lot of this stuff he helps us explain a lot of this stuff but then we also get the story within the story because we have then the other storyteller and he's basically helping take the place of the other storyteller at times because he's explaining what the storyteller is telling us god try to imagine that sentence right there so there's the this malingaloo who's telling the story to Dayindi. And Dayindi, I believe, is being played by... I don't... I'm not 100% on this, but I think he is David Gopalil's son or relative because he has the same last name and another name. That, because David Gopalil is being credited in this film as David Gopalil... Richmond, Richmond. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry, any um, Aboriginal people that are listening to this. Ridgemar Maril Dalithgalu, and this other guy is Jamie Dayindu Galopil Dayindugalu. So very similar <laughs> names. God, I feel terrible for. For stumbling over these. You know, can I, I I just have to say I love these names. Oh, they're so musical. Exactly. They're so musical. And I feel like they're full of dignity. You know, these these uh, multi-syllabic no, uh, names. Uh, every time they say it in the film, and I notice the narrator when he's introducing characters will say the name twice, pretty, pretty close on its heels. So I'll say this is... You know, uh, uh, Rigi Maril, and then he'll say Rigi Maril does this and this and that. And uh, I noticed that was a kind of a common theme of of repeating these these names, and it does end up rather musical, song like. We've got David Gopalil as the storyteller on the outer side. Then in the inner side, we've got Mingalu telling the story to Dayindi, and he's telling this story of Rigi Maril who has all these wives and the the younger brother of Rijmaril who is Yipril he is lusting after one of his brother's wives which is the same thing that's happening in this outer story and it's nice that we go from this vivid color of David Gopalil's world to black and white which is the, our framing device our main framing device here with the storyteller and them going out and making these canoes and coming back and they're hunting geese and doing all this kind of stuff he's telling this story to this younger man and it's basically relating the exact same thing because the younger man in this story is kind of lusting after another woman as well. And then that middle story, the heart of the film we've got in brilliant color again. So it's kind of nice that the past is actually the, the vivid stuff. It's not that kind of trope that we've talked about on the show before where anything in the past is automatically in black and white. I was trying to figure out these multi layers of, which, you know, when to go to color, when to go to black and white, because it doesn't really seem all that standard of what we're used to with other films. I thought that was actually uh, a nice touch, uh, and it does help kind of separate 
what is going on when when we're in the storyteller mode and when we go back to ancient times and i thought it was a great way to show how the story that the uh the storyteller is telling is is the important part here that the story itself is what lends our lives power and that's kind of uh, symbolized by the vivid color and brilliant cinematography and lighting of the the, the far far past. I mean, some of those shots are re- they really come to life uh, in comparison to when the group of tribe is you know stripping the bark off the trees to make canoes in the mm-hmm. middle section or the framing device section. And then we go one level deeper. You know, this is this is the our inception moment, I suppose, here, where we have within that middle story, we have one more level, which is that these guys that are in this tribe are often proposing things like there's multi discussions where they're talking about what happened to the one guy's wife, what happened to Ridge Morel's wife. And each of them kind of has their own story as to what they think had happened. They meet this stranger, and they think about, okay, what's going to happen with this stranger? And they each have this proposition. And in those times, we go to this kind of desaturated color. So it's like another story within there because we see each of their versions of these different things. Like, hey, let's go attack this other tribe. How are we going to do it? Let's do it at night. No, that's a stupid idea. But yet they show what the attack would look like when it happens happens yeah it's almost like rashomon only instead of different perceptions it's different uh ideas being actually reenacted and i love that kind of stuff because it, it's it, that happens in a lot of my favorite comedies where it's like you know what would happen if this were to take place and then you kind of snap back into reality and you're like oh okay no we haven't done that yet you know it's uh it, it's almost like a dream sequence but just usually it's a little catchier, funnier, and quicker. And these are very quick. I mean, some of these cuts in here are very fast, and you wouldn't necessarily expect that from a, you know, like I think of something like, uh, you know, uh, uh, animals are people too, like where they're talking about the Bushmen of the Kalahari, and that's very languid in their storytelling a lot of times. And so this is like very much the opposite. It's like these quick cuts, a lot of close-ups and everything, and I love the way that so many people just address the camera directly. It's very intentional whenever the storytelling pacing is sped up or slowed down to a uh, a more deliberate pace. And sometimes, uh, particularly the way the story is actually delivered explicitly through narration, uh, he will give pauses between lines and really slow it down. And they even explicitly address that by saying, this is where you learn patience, you know, and then there are the times you're talking about, particularly where they have these reenactments of what could happen or what may have happened. And you're right. It's almost, <laughs> it's almost like family guy where they have a, a random act and, and they'll cut to show what the random thing is. And they'll cut back to the present time. It might be a minute tops of, of, some kind of action happening you mean like the time you had tea with muhammad the prophet of the muslim faith come on muhammad let's get some tea try my mr t t and i love that the story within the story like the core of everything it's so funny to me because so much of it hinges on two things that happen one a stranger comes to camp So everybody kind of freaks out about this stranger coming to their camp. And apparently he doesn't approach the right way. He doesn't warn them that he's about to be there. So they kind of turn around and see this guy. And it's just like, you know, okay, that's not the right way to do it. And really, again, so much of this movie is about teaching you the proper way. This guy does not come to camp in the proper way. And then the other thing is this woman who goes missing, one of the wives who goes missing. And it's the wife who was the object of the one guy's affection and you know, was the one, the other guy's wife. And it's just, um, you know, so much of it becomes like this paranoia. It's almost like the monsters are on Maple Street kind of thing, where it's just like they start blaming everything on this stranger. How dare he come in here? You know, this is, everything is going wrong. There's a sorcerer that lives in their camp who, 
well, kind of stays out of the fray a little bit, and he's right there to prey on all of their fears and just starts selling all this malarkey about, you know, yeah, the stranger's going to come in, he's going to steal your shit, like literal shit, and then your stomach's going to blow up and you're going to explode. So this guy's a politician is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, very much. Stoking the fear. I'm not saying that all of the strangers are bad, but they tend to send their worst people to our camp. We should have no amnesty for strangers in our camp. We should build a wall around our camp to keep those strangers out. That's right. They should get guns, and then that way they wouldn't have to worry about it. Yeah, these spears, they're old school. They really need to get some guns. Wow. <laughs> you know, you, you mentioned that this film is a, is a story about storytelling, and I think that's very true. But I think I'll go one farther, and I'll, I'll say that this is uh, a, this film is a story about traditional storytelling in a very old world sense where where stories were parables that showed us how to behave and i think that all of this paranoia about the stranger that you're talking about it's in the story that oh goodness gracious here we go i'm not going to attempt the name but uh in, in the framing device it's in the story that's being told to the uh, younger brother and it's almost another lesson that's learned is is, uh, is is see what comes of this kind of paranoia, this kind of rash thinking and, and jumping to conclusions, because there are some consequences that result from this. Yeah, definitely. Very bad things happen when it comes to this. And I love, too, that that framing device, so you know, outside of David telling us the story, this framing device of the the expedition out to make these canoes and everything that that story being told takes place over a number of days and that we get the other tribesmen making fun of the storyteller about how long it's taking him to tell this story and you mentioned before the whole value of patience and everything and i just love that it's like we are there with these people over a number of days though of course it's condensed into two hours worth of movie time but that is a beautiful idea that you go out on this expedition with these guys, with your tribesmen, and you have the one guy who's there just telling this elaborate tale over the whole period of time. It's just like, wow, that must, you know, if you were there, that must have been really something. Well, and, and they do mention as well that, you know, they strip the trees of this particular kind of bark that they can make canoes from. And then they have to submerge the bark in the waters of the swamp to help get it to a malleability. Uh, but the the distance between the trees and the, the swamp is quite far. So there are all these opportunities as these men are walking and doing this kind of uh, very automatic kind of labor where it would be quite a, a, a boon to them to have a storyteller among them passing the time in this way. I mean, why don't they just listen to their iPod or something? I mean, come on. They play with their phone. They're walking through the forest and the swamp and just looking down, checking their status. Right. Like, it's hard. still in the swamp. Hashtag bored. <laughs> it's, hard Hashtag. To keep your, it's hard to keep your iPhone when you have no pants. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if you are afraid of full frontal male and female nudity, this is not the movie for you. Although, in terms of the framing, he does. It, it's not like he dwells on it. So it's just like, all right, there's a guy in a long shot, and he happens to be naked. But when when they move towards the camera, it's like you're up to you know chest height or whatever. So it's you know it's it, there's none of that. I mean, it's it's like uh, if you grew up as a kid reading National Geographic magazine, it's like eh, whatever. It's filmed with appropriate nonchalance in, in that regard. It's it's simply – it is what it is. And it, it does bring up very interesting uh, perceptions that these people have that, you know, uh, Mike just mentioned the whole covered prick thing. They There's a very different way that the characters approached – any kind of coverings. And in fact, the stranger had a more, uh, shall we say, modest loincloth, not that much more, but enough that that was part of what made them immediately distrust him is that uh, is that his genitals were slightly more covered than theirs. 
And, you know, they went on to say, why is he covering up? Is it small? Never must touch a, trust a guy with a small prick. I mean, they all of these uh, prejudices started coming up. And it was explicitly about what he was wearing. I found that very interesting. Yeah, they have nothing really to go on with this guy. So they immediately start jumping to all these conclusions, which just, again, kind of that xenophobia. You know, he is he is just from another tribe. And in our eyes, our Western racist eyes, it's like, well, you guys all look alike to me. Come on. You know, what's the difference? But to them, it was a huge difference in the way that he was partially dressed over the way that they're dressed, the way that he had his hair styled, the way that he had like the mud on his face, these kind of things. Whole world of difference to these guys. You stay with your tribe. You have the mark of your waters, these kind of things. You do not stray outside of that. So they are like very willing when it comes to different tribes and stuff like, okay, we're going to go to war with this tribe. We'll talk about going to war with this other tribe. And very much, again, trying to stay within what is the proper way. And even when there's a murder that happens in this film and then a kind of redemption around the murder, the world was in balance with the murder. And then they have to now make things right and they have to go back to that proper way. Yeah, there there are lots of rights that are observed in this film. You know, I, I kind of want to um, digress slightly here on your point about uh, the conclusions they're jumping to and more specifically about how they view each other's differences and they have their own xenophobia amongst themselves that uh, wouldn't necessarily be as perceptive to someone from the outside like like us. And, and like you said, our, our racist ideas, like what what's the difference, right? I mean, I, I can imagine very easily someone having that reaction. And uh, and it's that's I think is the beauty of cinema is that it can communicate this kind of idea that uh, uh, people have identities all over the place and those identities can be very strong. And sometimes it can lead to, you know, some let's shall we say uh, uh, conflicts. But, you know, here, here's an example is uh, just this past weekend, I had a filmmaker who lives in Tokyo and she flew into my film festival and she was telling me she went to another film festival in Utah and I don't want to bag on Utah, but uh, she was telling me stories about how she would go out to the bar afterward and try to show her ID. And the people were like, what's this in Chinese? And she'd say, no, it's Japanese. And they would respond with, oh, it's all the same. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, it's, I found that like rather unthinkable that that still happens, but it's the same concept in a way, you know, that uh, what uh, an outsider or someone from another country will, or our country will perceive as being the same. It's quite different amongst um, amongst the groups themselves, you know, <laughs> a Japanese person and a Chinese person certainly don't want to be confused with each other <laughs> in general. You talked about ritual and the whole idea of, you know, as I was talking about making things right and everything and that ritual at the end. I mean, I think that's probably it feels like it's one of the longer sequences of the film, the whole idea of what happens to Rich and Morrill. And that, to me, is one of the most beautiful sequences of the whole film. Just the way that it's shot, the way that the story is being told at that point, the music. I mean, especially when David Gopalil starts talking about the way that the music is coming into it, you know, and now the drums, and now the didgeridoo, and all that. And just getting all of those layers, and then seeing Rich Morrill doing his whole thing, it's like, wow. This, it, you know, it, it's... Because so much of the story is told well i can't say it's told straightforwardly but as far as like there's not a lot of like you know tricks and you know camera craziness you know we're not dollying in from 500 <laughs> feet away into anything there's that really great scene when those spears are being thrown at rich morrill and his brother and they're moving so fast and dodging these things so much that they're basically, you know, it's like a double exposure of those guys and the spears and the spears just passing right through them. I love that bit. And that's probably the most, 
you know, trickery, quote unquote, that we get in the film and everything else. There's probably a lot of other trickery going on, but so much of it is in advancement of the story that I don't even necessarily notice it. But when it comes time to call attention to some of the more cinematic moments, I mean, that end sequence there is just so lovely and it really kind of you know puts a fine point on the way that the film the actual literal film is being used to tell this story yeah there is um <clears throat> it's a very documentary feel except for those moments where, where uh the story has a a real turning point like the macarada with the the throwing of the spears and and of course the, the probably what has to be the moment with the most weight is the passing of Reggie Muriel's soul from from the earth to the sky uh, which requires almost being led through song through the songs of his tribesmen and uh as well as you know all kind i think they paint the symbol of his uh, water hole on his chest so his soul can find his water. Uh, all these things are observed with uh, with solemnity, as well as, like you said, uh, more cinematic flair. Uh, particularly the dance. The dance is just magically shot with the lighting and and its slow motion and the way that the bodies move is. It's a really, really well crafted scene. This film is so. Uh, it's there's a lot of reflection uh, rather than. I don't know, a lot of complicated storytelling. So uh, it really does, the experience of this film hinges on sitting down and letting the location wash over you. Uh, in fact, that is, and it starts off that way. The, the, the film opens with this uh, flowing overhead uh, I guess it must have been a, a helicopter shot just going over Australia and the, the wilderness. It's really gorgeous. And, and that's kind of the way the film goes for the rest of, of that moment on is, is just immersing you in the locale and the time and a very different culture than you might be used to. That opening is gorgeous and that does kind of call attention to itself, but it does build that world so well for us that we just kind of are exploring this northern part of Australia. You can say, like, okay, all forests look alike, but no. I've never seen any landscape that looks like what we see in Ten Canoes, except perhaps in other Australian films. <laughs> but even the way that it's being shot, it doesn't look like other Australian films. You know, I've seen Walkabout, I've seen, you know, Rabbit Proof Fence, these kind of things. This has a very distinct look to it. The other thing that I like in here beyond we were talking about the use of color is the use of close-ups in the, I, I think it's probably about 10 minutes, 15 minutes in, where he starts introducing all the various people in the tribe. And it's sort of these almost like close-up portraiture thing where you watch them and then their expression kind of changes a little bit as the camera lingers on them. It's kind of the, 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 the concept in a way for me as I was watching it of like the, uh, the old Warhol screen test idea that if you put a camera on someone long enough, then I guess their true personality comes out in some way because they have to react to this thing in their face. So although these people who are playing these characters or these individuals in this story are not – technically on camera if you know what i mean like like there's no camera in this society but there's something about holding on them and then we get this sort of personality come through there's like a laugh or a smile or something that seems to come through as we're introduced to these various people i like that we get echoes of that as we go through this because we get those close-ups of these people as we're going through and then we get those again like when they put on their war paint and we get mm -hmm. okay now here are these people again and you know going around that circle we get a lot of that like going around the circle of who these people are and their opinions about things and it's just like oh okay this is pretty cool and you know we get their 
individual personalities through that because you could easily be like, you know, because yes, we're having trouble struggling with some of these names and everything, but we know every character by the end of this film. We have been introduced to them and they all have something distinctive about them. And luckily, it's not like, you know, I mean, of course, yeah, like this is the fat guy who loves honey, but there's more to that character and what he the role he plays inside of the story. And I really kind of appreciate that too. Yeah. And that's, that's the least subtle one too. I mean, the, the rest of the characters and their personalities and the things that set them apart from each other are, are far more subtly done, particularly with uh, Reggie Morrill and his, and his younger brother. And that's one of like, that goes back to what I was saying before about how human they are in the way they act with each other uh, and how that can be a a, uh, contrast to how indigenous people are portrayed in in other films or similar films. This could have easily gone bad. And fortunately, it it didn't. You know, it, it, it is very respectful of these people throughout the entire film. At least that's the way it feels. And, you know, like we talked about like, oh, yeah, there's a fart joke in the beginning and everything. Yeah, but it's it's basically showing these people are humans. You know, they they laugh, they cry, they fart, they do all this stuff. They are very, very human. So it's not like walking anthropological sketches of people. Right. I mean, the fart joke is done in such a way that it's not uh, a buffoonish moment. It is a, look, these are a bunch of dudes doing their work together. It's like uh, construction workers on a construction site. It's, it's, it, it seems familiar. And, and it opened, we're introduced to this group that way. And, you know, they're walking and then the fart joke happens at the very beginning of the film. This is our welcoming into their into their space because it could seem to uh, to, to us a bit alien and a bit other and a bit unwelcoming. But when the opening scene is, hey, this guy farted, he needs to walk at the back of the line. <laughs> That invites us in, you know? It, it, it lowers our guard, I think. I thought that was brilliant. Right, and they're just busting his balls like every group of guys ever, you know? <laughs> like, oh, man, you're rotten on the inside. And they go, yeah, yeah, I'm rotten, I'm rotten. All right, we're going to take a break and play a pair of interviews. The first is a continuation of our interview with Ian Jones from our Baby, Baby, Baby episode where we covered Bad Boy Bubby. The second is a talk with the director of Bad Boy Bubby and Ten Canoes and so much more, Ralph DeHare. We'll play both of those after these brief messages. Hello from Cinema Detroit, Metro Detroit's only truly independent cinema. We deliver an eclectic mix of current indie, genre, cult, and classic movies in the heart of the city. Like a sommelier choosing wine for his or her guests, we handpick our slate of films, many of which are exclusive to the metro area, the state of Michigan, or occasionally the entire Midwest region. Cinema Detroit features a unique setting in a former school and a warm hometown atmosphere, including always fresh popcorn, Detroit-made Fago soda, and other locally created treats. Please visit our website, cinemadetroit.com, for the latest features and showtimes. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Tumblr. We look forward to seeing you soon at 3420 Cass Avenue in Midtown Detroit, 48201. Let me ask you a question. Are you getting enough? I bet you'd love more, right? Well, AdamandEve.com wants to give you more with 10 free gifts. First, you'll get a sexy surprise for her. Second, a specially selected toy for him. And third, a little something we know you'll both enjoy. Plus, you'll get six full-length adult movies on DVD. And number 10, free shipping on your entire order. So what do you have to do to get your 10 free gifts? It's not hard. Just go to adamandeve.com and select any one item. It could be an adventurous new toy, sexy piece of lingerie, or anything you desire. Just enter offer code BOOTH at checkout, and you'll get all 10 free gifts. Go check out adamandeve.com today. Select one item and get 10 free gifts including free shipping when you enter offer code BOOTH. 
That's B O O T H at adamandeve.com. All right, I'm here with Bill Byforce and Mr. Chris to tell you a little bit about Outside the Cinema. All right, Reverend Scott, take us to church. Uh, what can we expect to find from a typical show? Two hours of just random blabber. <laughs> uh, is there anyone's coattails you wrote in on to popularity? I'm the guy that f***ing burns the coattails and then pisses on him. You review all these exploitation, <laughs> horror, comedy, cult, and often all-around terrible movies. You must have a strong driving force that keeps you going. Ego. <laughs> and I don't know if I've heard you say that before. Uh, yeah, I've been saying that for a while. Really? I have been saying that for a while. Also, I'm high on smack. Well, it's definitely working for you guys. Yeah. People are coming out in droves to support you on iTunes. We just the other day got a, a, a one-star review on iTunes. Well, that is one That is one star too many. <laughs> Let me tell you. The worst f***ing piece of shit I've ever heard. This has been great, guys. Thanks, Scott. Ah. That was good. Oh, he's got you crying over there. I'm good for the rest of the year. Nice. That was too much. When a director comes to you and says, this is how I want to shoot something, how much of it is their vision versus you having to make this happen versus you kind of injecting yourself and and bringing something to life as far as how a movie is going to look? Here's the DOP. I don't... um the DOP or DP is definitely, if you don't bring something to the table, you know, it's nonsense. You, you must bring something to the table. You must bring, when you read the script, you take on a vision. This it, It's sort of part of I think, your responsibility. There's this vision. Now, whether, it, whether there is also going to be examples of that vision or examples of how things perceivably could look or the direction certain camera angles may go in or the breaking down of all the, this, um, what we, I suppose we call the look, you know, is contributed by light, contributed by uh, lenses, contributed by the camera, um, and the, obviously the cast as well. I, I believe, you know, costuming has a, an amazing uh, contribution to all that, and of course the location where you place it. So there's always elements, but I think you, you, as a DP, you need to bring certain parts of that, and of course your director is as well, because they've either got a passion for films that they've seen in the past, and they went, wow, that's really that really stands out. Uh, I'd like to see that, that, and that, and I think it, then it becomes an amalgamation a little bit of both of you bringing that those elements into fruition. You know, for once, one I can't remember this film, but it's a bit like if I remember probably. Tracker was probably let's just shoot it on a you know basically a fifty mil anamorphic lens and never change lens and just see what we can make. <laughs> and I think Rolf even brought that up. And in fairness to a DP, you go, yeah, I'm happy with that challenge. I can make that work because you know you don't get these opportunities <laughs> very often because sometimes they can be you know can be a little bit more regimented than that. I, that didn't happen. I think we ended up with using two lenses. I think it was a 50 and a 75 anamorphic. But you do anyway in anamorphic, so you, you don't have a great range of primes. Uh, and by nature, it, they tend to, it tends to fall into those categories of 50, 75, 100 possibly. So, no, with Ralph Tracker, I, cre- I definitely created... That was probably um, a film that I... In Australia here, the, uh, I, well, the rest of the world's the same, but... You either had choices, I think at one stage we had Kodak, Agfa and Fuji and Agfa went away and so there was Kodak and Fuji and Kodak I've always in my mind thought it was always sort of biased in the red area and a lot of early Australian outback films have always been quite red and you get this red um, nuance through the film which that's fine, we put it down to the red outback and we put it down to you know the, the heat of the sun I dare say, the colour of the sun and so forth, and that's been accepted. Yet, when you look at some of our early painters, and particularly um, Albert Namajira, who's a very early uh, indigenous Australian painter, he had the, the mauves and the purples and the and the whites, the quite not vivid whites, but really strong, uh, I'll call them powdery whites, uh, in his paintings. And I've always admired that. And quite honestly, a late afternoon can actually had a lot of those hues of the, 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 the mauves and the purples in. So having worked with Chris Doyle, I operated and did second unit. Uh, I did steady cam and second unit on rabbit proof fence, fence and um, Chris Doyle shot main unit. And I was quite integrated into that camera department with Chris and Phil Noyce. And that's because of my past connection with Phil. 
What Chris Doyle has done has really, to me, thrown a lot of values, tossed them up in the air, and you just grab a few of those and say, look, I like that and I like that idea, but I don't. that's been very traditional. I don't want to go that way. And Chris does this all the time. He's quite an extraordinary sort of gentleman. And so he um, was doing doing things on Rabbit Proof Fence, which I probably hadn't experienced before with previous DOPs that I've worked with or DPs that I've worked with. And so I took some of those on board and Tracker uh, was a result that I really loved and saw finally a film in my mind that didn't have these red, uh, a red bias about. And I'm very happy with the result of Tracker of how we approached that. It was a film shoot. It um, Filtration, the way they went with filtration gave me a look. So much so, we were quite isolated. So our rushes or dailies, as you would call them, uh, we ne- our only way of me uh, knowing how things really weren't was the next, um, our rushes were two days behind or dailies were two days behind. I would ring every day, but I was ringing about dailies that were two days previously. And so the word was coming through from the laboratory at the time saying, there's just this great look about it. It's got this real, and they said it, they said it's got this real Albert, Albert managerial look. And I went, yes, that's gold. And so uh, I was very happy with that approach. Things like money is always an issue with budgets, with smaller budgeted films. So... For me, I, um, we needed to work at different times of the day. I did things like I made sure in the budget there was enough money to cover pushing and pulling of the stock, which meant that I could rate it at any ASA rating that I chose. So I chose one stock. Um, and I said, OK, I can push and pull this as much as I want. And that gave me flexibility early morning, late afternoon and midday. So I was, it, it was just a quite a, an enjoyment, enjoyable film from the point of view of being able to um, play with filters a bit more than I have in the past probably and also um, play with the stock which in fairness to Chris Doyle uh, set that example to me on rabbit proof things. You talked a little bit about the tracker. I have to say that I love the look of that film. I really love the look of Ten Canoes. What happened with Ten Canoes was that um, again budget wise and restrictions and I was writing wise for tracker was very minimal lighting. We were quite very isolated in different mountain ranges at a place called Arkarua. So getting generators, part of the, the role to hear story with the sound recorders of guys, gentlemen, well known James Curry, is um, the problem with generators, they make noise, even if you, know, you hear them. And, and if you're in a, a close valley, you, you definitely hear the noise of the generator. So a lot of tracker was shot with um, reflect, um, at that time, quite primitive in um, portable lighting power. So it was um, reflective boards, white sheets, and uh, the occasional sun gun, which we had. There's uh, a, a night sequence, in, um, uh, and we shot the, the night sequence, or it's four, I think, night sequences. We shot over four nights. Um, we shot literally in the same area, as you probably appreciate at night, you don't quite know where you are. So I brought in a healing balloon for that so we could con- condense the cost. So it was around the luxury of the he- healing balloon and um, we shot in and around that balloon. We did have generators then and so we, we very much compressed what we required and needed for those four sequences. When it came to 10 canoes, a couple of shifts took place it was the, um, the digital intermediate had come about and I sort of approached Rolf and said, look, we'd be, be nonsense if we didn't look at this digital intermediate. Yeah, there is a cost and it's quite an expensive cost, but it gives us so much power uh, in post that, you know, we can play with the images and give it, you know, something that we potentially couldn't get out of tracker. And he hummed and hard about that for a while and he came back to me and said, well, we can't afford it. They've done their sums. And I said, okay, fair enough. And then... The film got deferred for a number of different reasons. And so by the time I'd been spoken to, to the time I actually shot it, I think it might have been about three years even. But I'll say it was two years. By that stage, the digital intermediate had come a long way. We had a laboratory. We've got had a number of laboratories in Australia, but one in particular we were going to probably use out of Sydney. They had made the transition. They'd moved physically their premises. And when they, when they moved, they actually didn't... Um, they moved straight into the digital world. And they didn't... To do a... Um, uh, any uh, effects on film, they weren't using the Oxbury anymore. It was all going to go down the data path. 
So they actually met Rolf halfway and said, look, we can subsidise this firm for your DI because that's where we're going anyway. You're asking for some effects, which we probably can't deliver you through the Oxbury system. It has to be data anyway. So they were, that was one of the first, it was the first 4K out film in Australia, and that was through a deal that happened with the laboratories. Um, and as you probably appreciate, being the black and white and the colour, the amount of layers that have to take place to deliver that is quite difficult. And then there was the subtitles involved with that as well. So in effect, the film, we, we all benefited by everyone compromising. It was just great and, you know, and sharing the cost, basically. So that gave us that look of that film just by the nature of everyone working in that post area and delivering. There was a French gentleman who, who um, can't think of his name right this second, who was the uh, colourist on the film and uh, for at, um, uh, at Lab is where the film was post-produced and he did a sterling job. We sat with him, Rolf and I sat initially and then I sat with him and he's um, feeling for what we should have should manipulate what we shouldn't manipulate was true to the story and um, yeah, my heart goes out to him as a dp you probably want to change every image but um as we all know the film does have to have its own life and that's what we that's what we um pursued and endeavor to deliver you mentioned the king is dead i haven't had a chance to see that one or charlie's country yet i've been waiting for those to finally be available um here in the states yeah, so The King is Dead, yeah, it was um, a film that uh, Rolf, uh, uh, to some degree, has has a, a story or has some uh, sense of the story through things that it, he's been associated with in his life. So that's the basis of, of the story, I dare say. And it was, do we shoot a film or do we go data? And then Rolf, was, I don't, don't know why it came about, but he decided that we could probably shoot it on a, a 7D or a 5D. And I went, ah, oh, really? <laughs> um, and in fairness for any DP, you could have, I believe you've got to take the most of your opportunity. So I'm, I'm, I went, okay. And I, I took that on board purely because I felt that, um, one, there's budget restrictions. I don't necessarily always ask what the budget is. I, I'm aware of what money that I'm probably going to have available to me and what I can cover in that area, that's equipment as well as crew. But I tend not to get involved with the other areas. I say, can I believe that can be? It, you can take on board issues you don't need to. So I think it can cloud your vision sometimes. So I tend not to, uh, and I have faith in Rolf and the way it works. So the King's Dead was probably a little bit different because of the, the, the nature of what we're going to use, and it was definitely out of Rolf's knowledge uh, regarding the data world and the implications and the complications and. Some of the things that expected or maybe taken as being understood, but they're not understood, and they can later on bone you. I mean, it's a simple case of just uh, transferring data, whose responsibility that is, and if it's going to go to um, uh, an editor, or is it going to go via a post house, or you're going to set up post people. You know, there's all these questions that need to be asked. So, um, so in some ways, by Rolf stepping into this data world. Uh, he grew a lot of knowledge. So that was a learning curve for both, but it was equally me passing a lot of information on to him and asking where he, how he wanted to go about these areas, which previously weren't an issue in the film world. And the film was, you shot some film, it, it just definitely got, you know, went from a magazine into a can and off to a laboratory and they took over the post process. Um, but if you've not been in this transition time, which to some degree still exists a little bit, but when people haven't um, been associated with it, it is actually quite difficult and tricky to understand. So the King is Dead was shot on a 7D in the end. I opted for a 7D over a 5D, and that had to do with the, the degree of focus. I find the 5D just very critical in the focus area, and the 7D seemed to be able to deliver the things that I, I, I needed, so that's where we sat. We actually had a good... I think they were the, the, the bottom-of-the-range CP spherical lenses, uh, they work quite well. Um, the film itself didn't hasn't really gone anywhere. That can be a number of reasons. But in Australia here, the distri- the person, the, the company that distributed the film, um, were not the people for the film. They they were they thought they would bought a, a different film than what they had actually bought. And so when the film finally got released, um, uh, I think it got released in one cinema in the other side of the country at Western Australia. That was their obligation. 
Rolf with a lady called um, Kathy, can't remember Kathy's surname, she, she was the uh, publicist with Rolf. They, on their own back, made sure it got released in, in Sydney and in Melbourne, but it didn't. Not many people really got to see it, unfortunately. Now, I did hear about um, Charlie's Country when it was going around to the different festivals. It sounds like that one definitely had more of a, a festival life. I don't know how uh, that one did in theatres. I'm not sure myself. I'll be quite honest. I haven't really followed that through. Rolf's actually still on the circuit in Europe at the moment with that film. I did go to Cannes with him and it got a good reception there. David Golkel uh, won Best Actor there in Uncertain Regard, which, you know, that's fantastic for him and fantastic for the film. Yeah, it, it is, I suppose, it's got a message. It's a very contemporary message in modern, uh, or for the modern world, I suppose, but it's also very contemporary message for modern white Australia and that's sort of the film what the, where the film sits basically uh, it will be seen and be viewed by and you're probably right in the festival circuit but it will be screened and viewed in the education circuit as well because uh, it's got some very interesting straight up and down points to be made about how Indigenous Australian is conceived and rules and regulations are put into place um, with no thought to other issues, basically. You have um, definitely shot David Gopal almost more than anybody else, I think. What does he like <laughs> to work with? <laughs> uh, David. Dear David. <laughs> no, he's a lovely man. He's a very lovely man. When you see Charlie's Country, you'll know David Gopal. <laughs> Because in, in some ways, as much as it shouldn't be spoken about, it is it is in truth sort of the the, the things that have happened to David over the, the, the time of his uh, contact with White Australia and, and his life with them in the film industry in a lot of ways. Um, the things that have gone on uh, in his life are very much portrayed in Charlie's Country. It's been interesting watching him grow up on film, you know, seeing him in Walkabout all the way up till now and, and being able to see him age as, a, as an actor and as a human being. Oh, no, absolutely, absolutely. But, you know, David David is the classic of, um, you know, he, he was found, you know, I won't say in the bush, but he was found in the bush and now um, where he fits within the modern world, it is tricky for David. There's no doubt about that. What is Force of Destiny? Force of Destiny was a film um, that, so I've, I've, I work with at this point in time. Uh, I'm being lucky enough to do films for two Dutch directors in Australia, um, Paul Cox and Rolf De Heer. And Paul Cox is a gentleman who's done, I suspect, about 23, 24 films in Australia. He's probably got 50 pieces of bodies of work that covers documentaries and so forth. And I've been lucky enough to be involved with his last four, maybe five. And Force of Destiny is the last film that he's um, about to be distributed, about to be released. And it's a money, it's a it's a love story. Well, uh, uh, Paul, uh, is in, his scripts are very emotive, normally boy-girl relationships and very emotional relationships. And this story takes place with a liver transplant victim and a lady he meets uh, during that process that happened to be Indian. And so we shot it in Melbourne, uh, Victoria, and we also, and country Victoria. We also shot in India at, um, at, um, in Kerala, in the province of Kerala, in the state of Kerala. Uh, we finished that earlier this year. We finished uh, that about April, maybe. I'm uh, not trying to slag anybody, but I was curious, was Highlander 2, what was that shoot like? Oh, for me, oh, look, I come from a different level from a lot of ways, um, meaning that I was sought after, they were looking for a Steadicam operator, and um, I was recommended by Dean Simler to Russell Mulcahy. I was brought over there as a specialist Steadicam operator, and I met um, the DP, the English DP called, he's actually a very nice man, I've worked with him since, up in Queensland on a film. I can't remember now. It's naughty, he's not sure to remember those names. He caught me off hand. Look, I'm at that point a crew member, so I had my own personal experiences. So very hard for me to comment. I enjoyed the shoot. I enjoyed the time I spent there. I was actually, I was on one stint. I was going away to go and work with Rolf, and they did want me back, but I couldn't come back. Or they actually wanted me to stay, and I couldn't stay because I committed to Rolf. So the rest is history, really. 
But um, I did have a good time on the film. It was a big film, there's no doubt about that. And that's um, Pans and Davies, isn't it? the producers. I enjoyed it, Argentina. But I'm the wrong person to ask um, in some ways. You know, the, the end film is what the end film is. We've all seen it. <laughs> I've seen multiple versions of it, which is crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I don't <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> what have been some of your favorite films to work on? I mean, in fairness to, um, uh, you, I think it's, it's a, we call it Evil Angel, I think it's A Cry in the Dark in the States, isn't it? That film with uh, Meryl Streep and Sam Newman, yeah. Um, look, just, just to be around Meryl Streep, I, you know, some funny experiences happened. Um, she's such a golden girl, I mean, really. I can't, uh, that, just to have, to, go, to be the operator on a film and you have her on the other side of the lens is just something you know, I'll never, ever forget. I remember in a makeup test, you know, in the back streets of Melbourne, a funny little building, and she's come to town and we're going to do these makeup tests and we all met her, you know, um, uh, cautiously, but also met her with uh, dignity and so forth. And then I put my eye to the viewfinder and then there was this Meryl Streep that I'd seen on many, many, many films before over many, many times and just go, wow, aren't I lucky? And it never, and that, in all fairness, that never diminished every time um, Mel was the other side of that camera. We, the respect was just huge, you know. And um, we all tried tricks. And she plays games. It's just fantastic. No, my good games, I mean, you know, good fun games and stuff. And so the relationship with the Australian crew with her was just gorgeous. And of course, Sam, you know, all, and the Australian cast were just in awe of her. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, Russia House took me to Russia. I've been, um, I ended up in Russia after that again, but just to go to Russia before the wall came down, um, we got, <laughs> we got silver service. I mean, I don't know who paid who or what or what, but just, we put a camera on the back of it, uh, you, we call them a tracking vehicle, but you'd call them a, I think you use another name, but just a flat, a flat bedded vehicle, which you can put cameras on, um, what do you call them? There's another name for these mistakes. Oh, I'm a trucking vehicle doing. And we drove through the streets of Moscow, and they had the power to turn the lights on and off, you know, like the green light on, the red light off at the street corners and so forth. And we'd be shooting all where... This is, this is just before the war came down. This is still communist China, uh, communist Russia, and you're shooting buildings, you're rolling on buildings, which were, in all fairness, you know, you couldn't have done that four years ago. You would have been shot. <laughs> <laughs> so things like that, we just had the power. I don't know. I don't know who. I don't know. You know, I'll give Pathé and all of those the producers who put whatever they put into place. But um, the magic things that happened, you know, and the Russian crew, um, they um, the amount of food that we had as um, Westerners, and you know, it's made up of Americans, and English, and, and Australian personnel, and, um, and and you know, the food that we have. We'd stand back and let the Russians go first because I'd never seen such food in the, in the variety and the quantities, you know. Just films like that and, and to work with, I can't remember the, the uh, German actor, the German actor, the gentleman, the part in Russia House, a philosopher. Um, people like, you know, those cast members, you just, um, yeah, I mean, they deliver something which is um, just gives a film the depth and the enjoyment of being there. You know, and it's, what we do is important, but it's, it shouldn't. You know, the, the cast come first in my mind, and, and the opportunity for them to deliver. You know, the, the, the script is just magic. So, what are you working on now? Well, funnily enough, uh, I've been approached to involve with a documentary, which is actually the involvement of Indigenous actors in our film industry. Because one of the conceptions is, one wonders whether that how we perceive Australian Aboriginals, is that because of theatre and television and film? Um, and when you actually look at how we see them, is that correct? And we have perceptions as white Australia of, of we've got stereotypical attitudes and has that been caused by film? So it's a good, it's a good topic. When the writer, uh, well, writer, producer, director actually rang me, uh, his name is, um, he's done a number of Indigenous pieces of work. His name is um, Curtis Levy. I was quite stoked. I went, yeah, no, this, I like the topic. I love the topic. And interestingly enough, I get to probably meet a lot of cast, uh, in, Indigenous cast I haven't worked with, but I'd love to meet. And equally, there's a lot of, lot of uh, directors there that have worked with these cast, which I've probably met socially, but not in, a, in this sense. Uh, I'm looking forward to it, actually.
How did you get your start in the business? I drifted into it, really. I guess it depends a little what you mean by the start. But look, when I was young, I went to uni and quit because it didn't, didn't work for me. And I ended up with a job as a storeman. Now, it just so happened that the storeman job was at the Australian Broadcasting Corporation in, uh, in Sydney. And I carted parcels and boxes and films around for four years or so. And thought, well, yeah, I've been here for four years. I might as well do something with it. Uh, and then so I did make another little job and another job. And I ended up being a publicist at, at the ABC. And I didn't like that uh, whatsoever. I hated being a publicist. Because by then, that was a sort of substantial job. Uh, and they didn't uh, want to start me again at the bottom. They wanted to get me publicity. And I thought, oh, well, I'm going to get ahead of you somehow. And... I applied for the Australian Film and Television School, which was the sort of preeminent educational authority at the time, just been started, uh, for film and television. I got in somehow. And three or four days after I got there, I thought, this is where I want to be. This is what I want to do. I guess that's one of the starts. Did you originally want to be a director or a writer, or what what kind of uh, turned you on? Uh, At the time, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I applied to get in to the film school because you had to apply with a particular specialty. I just picked a specialty that I thought would give me the best chance of getting in, which was production. But fairly quickly, what I, what I understood that I wanted to do really was, um, was to, to direct. And the thought of writing didn't occur to me because I didn't, didn't you know, see myself as being capable, really. Uh, and that's just grown over the years, um, just by doing and doing and doing and doing. And until now, it's at least 50% of what I do. How did Tale of a Tiger come about for you? That was a peculiar one. That was really the first big break, I suppose you'd say. I was working with a company that, uh, on on my own terms, oddly, it's like a long story really, I was working for a company for next to no money uh, because that's how I wanted it. So it means they could never tell me to do anything. They could only ask me to do things. And the company uh, was going broke. At the time, in Australia, there were tax incentives for film. And there was one film that was a possibility of going that fell apart the second last day of the financial year. Uh, and that was the last chance to save the company. So the three who remained, uh, the principal and another employee and myself, were going to meet the following day to split up the projects and sort of, you know, the company would go into receivership. But I got in first. There was one phone still connected by accident. Everything else had been cut off because there was no money to pay for anything. And a phone call came through and said, which said, you know, do you have anything between three and six hundred thousand dollars a project? And in fact, there was a documentary project that had been submitted to us by the a, a, a Melbourne mob. And uh, I said, yeah, yeah, we do, we do, we do. And by a uh, quarter to, by about five o'clock that afternoon, there was um, $440,000 in the bank. And by quarter to midnight, the contracts were signed, and it was meant to be a documentary about restoring a Tiger Moth aeroplane to be made by this Melbourne mob. But the, the financing was conditional, and uh, the conditions couldn't be met somehow. So I said, look, why don't we change it into a movie, into a feature film? We'll make it a kid's film. Kids are cheap. I'll direct it. And, uh, you know, you can produce it and you can be the exec- executive producer. And then at least we keep the money inside the company instead of this, this documentary one. So that's what we did. And, and on the basis of that, we got a deal. On the basis of a screenplay that I then quickly wrote, six weeks, blah, blah, blah. We got the deal. We got the distribution deal. And um, because you then accessed the money and made the film. It did surprisingly well. Uh, I think it's gone into profit over the years, and I think the investors were well happy. But it doesn't make your second film any easier. Uh, it's not the sort of film that does. But uh, it took another three years for the second film to come around. What was kind of the, the atmosphere like when it came to filmmaking in Australia at that time? It was It was pretty wild because the... The tax incentives were they were brought in because it was pretty it was pretty small and 
but it was a revival and it was interesting and there were good films being made. And then suddenly the tax incentives came in and they were meant to trigger perhaps five or ten million dollars worth of production. But within within a year and a half, I think, there was up to something like 200 million um, as, as the financial business took hold of this instead of the filmmakers. It used to be just the filmmakers running around with a, with a suitcase trying to put some money together. But then, you know, the financial companies moved in because there was money to be made. And so they, they cut the tax deductions and everything collapsed. Uh, they, they cut them down. Everything collapsed. Films were falling apart all over the place and, you know, blah, blah. And, but then within a year, you know, everybody worked out how to uh, exploit the new lot, uh, including, including a lot of people in America. You know, this American company, Hemdale, was, was one of the worst offenders. And exploiting this stuff, and uh, you know, then you know, then the government said, "Oh no, it's just 250 million is coming out." No, oh, I'll cut the tax deductions even further, so everything would collapse again, and, and and until everybody worked out how to make them work again, and off they'd go again. <laughs> it was, you know, it was, was was in in a financial sense, it was cowboy country, um, and a lot of films were being made, and and a lot were not getting released. And uh, eventually, they found a level for them that made it much more difficult for uh, for them to be exploited to the extent that they were. Uh, and the industry settled down quite a lot. But the eighties were, were were a pretty wild time in Australia, and some good films made as well, and some big films, important films, uh, um, and films that travelled enormously, like Crocodile Dundee, would never have been made without the tax concessions, and that's what it allowed at the time. I think that one film probably paid for everything the government ever ever put into it, really. Yeah, it was huge. One of the things that always impresses me is just how diverse your career is as far as the subject matter that you tackle. I mean, moving from Tale of a Tiger on to something like Incident at Raven's Gate, I mean, you wouldn't know that the same people were behind this. And then moving on to Dingo, I mean, it's just every film has such a different feel and tackles such different subject matter. Do you just have a wide range of interest, or do you just want to kind of challenge yourself? There's a number of things involved, but one of them in particular is that you know I discovered very, very early that making a film is exceedingly difficult uh, if, if you're serious about it, and I am. Um, and so, why would you want to do the same thing twice? Why would you want to repeat yourself, keep repeating yourself? Um, and so, I, I do look for the new and the interesting and and what's interesting is something I haven't done before. In another sense, some things are reactions against what I've done before. So, you know, what film I'll do and it'll be all outside and I'll get geez, God, that was horrible. You know, it was rain if the studio filmmaker. So, you know, and then you work in a studio and you sit in the studio all the time and think, no, no, I want to get outside. So there's an extent of that. And to an extent it's also circumstance, you know, what happens to be going at a particular time. But also stylistically, what I do is is when I'm on a, onto a new thing, I try and leave behind everything I've done before, everything I've ever seen before. And quite sort of, I think a lot about how should this story be told? And it's about this story. It's not about having a style or, or, or about... Uh, or about you know doing what I've learned before to do in a particular way and applying that to this. It's not about that. It's about trying to find something fresh and original for this one. And so I approach each film and each subject quite differently. What was it like working with Miles Davis on Dingo? Um, it was very good. Um, Miles and I ended up getting on extremely well, and there was a bit of luck in that involved as well. But we hit it off in a major way. And, in fact, we were talking about doing another film together that had nothing to do with music after the Ingo. Um, but, you know, obviously he died shortly after completing the film, so we never ended up doing that. Um, we were talking about that because he was, he was so, so good to work with, and he has a natural charisma. And I felt that if I wrote something that, that you know, now I knew him, that he could really do something extraordinary, really be a very fine actor. Yeah, and that was very good to work with him. How did a movie like The Tracker come about? 
Um, the tracker had a long gestation when, okay, it's partly dingo. Okay, now dingo was a difficult shoot. It was a big film, um, you know, bigger budget than anything I'd done. Um, you know, 70 people in Outback Australia, it's difficult. And we had a week of shooting on that where we went right into the Kimberley, which is a very remote region of Australia, very beautiful. And um, I'd worked out how to do that, which with, say, a crew of 10, I think it was, and and the two actors. Uh, and we had a safari tour organised, our original bloke, uh, who, who would cook for us and put the tents up and all that sort of stuff. And so the 12 people, you know, for a week... Uh, shot in regions where nobody had ever shot before. And it was a steady cam, and so we didn't have to bring dollies and things like that so we could move the camera and do really good things. Um, and spent a lot of time getting to a location, like climbing a mountain. You know, everybody has to climb the mountain, they do, but at the top it's wonderful. And it was the cheapest week of the film, and it was also by far the most enjoyable week of the film, and it was disproportionately valuable to the film. Uh, and I thought, gee, you know, to make a whole film like that, that would be the thing to do. And so that's where it started. It was just this concept in my head, not of a film, but how to make a film. And that concept sat there until the, the content came to meet it, which was I was doing research for a project I'd been commissioned to write. Uh, and it was it was indigenous history that well, I was really quite unaware of, and and suddenly those two things came together: what I was researching and the way to make a film. And suddenly this this idea came into my head as to how to make this film. And and in in one little three hour burst, I wrote an outline, say twelve pages, I think it was, uh, and put it away because I was writing something else. And the other thing ended up stopping. And then I tried to write the the, the screenplay, and but but by then Bad Boy Bubby was getting in the way. And in the end, the tracker sat in in the drawer for ten years, until I was asked, did I have anything of certain specifications? And the one thing I did have was the tracker, and so out it came. And it was financed on the basis of the the, the, the twelve pages, and then I could write the screenplay which was then quite a different screenplay. The, the story was exactly the same, but quite a different screenplay to the one that it would have been had I written it 10 years before, because 10 years before it was meant to be an intellectual discourse. And by the time I wrote it 10 years later, now the characters wanted to talk, and there's always too much talk, so I had cut it back and cut it back. And so then it had been quite a short script, but you know, the first the length of the film was the same. And the songs came into it, and the paintings came into it, and you know, it, it became exactly the story. But and we shot it in, in very much the way uh, that I'd, I'd, I'd intended. You know, steady cam even on the horse. You know, we sort of built a rig for the for the steady cam to go on the saddle, um, and it, it was great. It was great. They were shooting a great place to shoot it, and it was a great shoot. Was that your t- first time working with David Goldpolo? Yes, that was the first time I'd worked with him. Uh, and that was at the beginning of our relationship. So much of that movie kind of lives or dies by its performances, and you got such great performances from all the actors in that one. It was a, a great one to do. Gary Sweet's a very experienced actor, and and he he has this photographic memory, which is very useful. Uh, Damon Gamma was his first film. He was just out of acting school. And there was David, who was a bit all over the place, but 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 he's you know, the most extraordinary actor. Now... We, I thought about it, and I thought, well, we can shoot this largely in sequence, you know, particularly with a small crew. That's very helpful. And in terms of the location, because it was sort of a journey thing, it needed to fit in a certain way. And so I worked out to shoot largely in sequence, and 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 particularly for Damon, the 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 greenhorn, and he played a greenhorn in in the film. And and he could barely ride a horse when when because he damaged his leg just before the shoot, and he couldn't do his horse practice, but. He got thrown on the first day, and you know, but you can see during the film that the character's confidence grows, but then so does the actor's confidence grow, and it's because we were shot in sequence, and he could build his for his first film. He was so 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 raw. By the end of the film, he could write very well, and it shows in in in, in the performance, and it 
you know, it really was helpful. And David is such a good performer. And uh, Gary is such a giving actor to the other actors that he lifts them. No, it was, it was, it was wonderful. He shot Bad Boy Bubby in sequence too, right? Very largely, because that one we sort of had to, because he had to base certain parts of his performance on what has happened before. You never really know quite what's going to happen. Uh, and so, yes, we 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 shot the the studio stuff first, um, you know, where he's locked up. Uh, and, and there's no reason, because you've only got, you know, you've got him and mom for the first week, and so you can shoot that in sequence. doesn't make any difference. So you may as well. And, and because of the grading of the place as well. And then Pop comes into his world, and you have him for the second week. So then you do the things that you do, like... One of the things we did is the set, the the the, um, the place where he's living is almost fifty percent bigger once Pop comes because it's you know sort of meant to sort of represent his rise and expanding, and you know nobody ever notices, but it's there, it's it's there part of it. But to, so you do that, there's quite a big changeover. So you spend a couple of hours changing that over, and then you shoot the Pop stuff in the sequence, and then we go outside, and it's all local. And, and very largely, we can shoot it in sequence. And it's, it's look, it's you know, you use many films you can't, and that's fine. You work out how not to, uh, but if you can, it's it's really very helpful, particularly for small crews, and particularly for actors. I mean, it's uh, it's a joy for them to be shooting in sequence. How did a film like Ten Canoes come about? Ten Canoes came about. Ah, oh, look again, it's a very long story. But in the essence of it is that, that David had been asking me to make a, a film, another film with him, even before we'd made the tracker. Uh, he would always carry on about, you know, oh, make, come make a film up here, up here being where he, he lived with my people. And because I'd visited him up there before the tracker, I, I knew what the place was like. Uh, and it's not the sort of place you'd choose to go and make a film. It's extremely remote. It's very, very difficult with communications in particular because up there few people speak half decent English and there are no translators and the mosquitoes and the heat and the crocodiles and the mud and the you know, it's just a very difficult place and so there was no earthly way I was ever going to do that. But you know, one day thinking about things, uh, and David again, you know, constantly wanting to to uh, make another film and so on. I was thinking about, you know, the nature of Indigenous cinema in Australia and we've had the sort of glorious time of the tracker and, and rabbit proof fence and a few others and what had happened and that all stopped and um, I thought, I know what you could do, but I'm not going to do it. And and then, not shortly after that, I I, I had to make a film because uh, the film that I was trying to get financed was clearly going to take a long time to get financed and I couldn't afford that. And and I thought, oh, well, you know, it, you know, I, the only thing I could think of was to go up and make a film with David up there. But I thought, no, nah, I don't want to do that. I want to, it's too hard. It's just too hard. But then I couldn't think of anything else. And so I thought, I've got to get rid of this idea. So I'll introduce it to the office and, and people will say, yeah, lost. We're not going to do that. And so I... Yeah, you know, so how about we make a film up there, you know, with David and David go directing or make it in language and blah blah blah. And and there's this deathly self oh, so, yep, yeah, I've got them, I've got them. They're gonna say get lost. And they said, What a fantastic idea and then I had to do it of course. And so I rang David and said, Look, you know, can I come and see and five days later we were virtually signed off on what we were going to do. That's sort of how that came about. Yeah, I was very curious if you could understand what a lot of the actors were saying as they were saying it. No, I could not understand what they were saying at all, and I had to trust that the communication that we that had taken place was good. And in in the translations, it turned out that mostly it was very good, and and that that when um, no, when we did the translations for subtitling, that mostly it came back to us exactly the way I'd intended. Uh, and, you know, there were people as, as much as possible keeping an ear open for this and an eye open for it and, and, and so on. And occasionally it would go wrong, like there's one section early on in the piece where we had the devil of the time trying to get translation going. In the end, somebody who was in fresh came into it and said, look, you know, 
He's just talking gobbledygook. He's talking rubbish. That's why I can't translate it. And he's talking rubbish because he doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't know why he's there. Uh, anyway, we were able to cut around it and, and make it work uh, because ultimately it had to work for them as well. Uh, you know, I wasn't just going to translate my words onto their onto their different dialogue. You know. But uh, yeah, it was it's not easy, but but you learn to trust and you're know, working with people who care about what they're doing. I love the use of color in that. Yes, the color and the black and white. That was a a means of of. Again, of, of solving problems, uh, and, and the problems were many and varied. But yes, once, once I struck on the idea of splitting it up into two time spaces and one black and white and one, one color, uh, the, into the mythical past, then the film really started to come alive in, in a major way because it was the, there was a sort of lack of drama in terms of what they wanted because they didn't want old times to be depicted as a time of conflict. But once I thought about the mythical past, then that was okay. Anything could happen in the mythical past. Then we were able to retain the black and white, which has got this extraordinary sort of ethnographic and archaeological feel almost. Um, ethnographic, I think, is the best way, which they were very keen on because there was an anthropologist who, who had worked out of there years and years and years ago who'd taken these extraordinary shots. And so we were able to retain both that and get the colour going, and, and get the conflict going, uh, and have this film that was you know, pretty interesting in, in its texture. There's one moment in the film where it looks like one of the actors grabs the camera and kind of moves it more yeah, towards yeah. him. <laughs> well, it's one of those spontaneous things. <clears throat> he was just in it, and so that's what he did. And I thought, okay, well, let's put it in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of takes you out, but at the same time, it's it's perfect. It, it just works yeah, so well. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. It's one of those difficult decisions you make in, in the edit uh, because it does break the, the fourth wall uh, down. You know, it smashes it apart, really. But it's such a good moment that, that you think, well, it's worth it. It's just, just worth doing. Yeah. You have a, a film on your CV called uh, The Balanda and the Bark Canoes. Is that kind of an offshoot of Ten Canoes? That's a, it's a documentary, and it was it, it's, it's a documentary about the making of Ten Canoes. It's not really it's, it's not a making of. It's a more sort of philosophical, cultural thing. Uh, but it's done at the time of, of the making of, of Ten Canoes. Um, and you know, in, in the end, uh, I'm only partly responsible for it, and responsible really for getting it into a mess, and other people pulled it out of the mess. Um, because we're just too busy and, and, and so on. And we ended up with, with 100 hours of dreadful footage, not all of it dreadful, but some of it was dreadful. And, and I just couldn't uh, couldn't go on with it. And then, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so but it was salvaged beautifully. Now, I know Ten Canoes was really critically lauded and you know, won some awards and all this. How was it accepted, though, amongst the Aboriginal cult, the people that you know, were either your subjects or other folks that saw it? Oh, it's significant for them. It's exactly what they want. Um, in some way, it, it, it's for them, it preserves an aspect of their culture that and it puts it down in a really major way. And uh, no, it's, it's very, very good. Uh, they like it a lot. Uh, and it's generally recognized as being you know, a significant film. You know, it makes a contribution. As an Australian filmmaker or a person who's making films in Australia, do you have to be really cognizant when it comes to your approach to Aboriginal culture? Do you have to kind of run it past folks to make sure that it's not going to be offensive or anything like that? I don't do these things without really seriously looking after that side of things. With both Ten Canoes and Charlie's Country, I gave a lot of creative control. Because otherwise, you know, you know you, there has to be ownership by them of this, this staff. And if there's not, it's not going to work. I work very closely. And there are cultural advice and all this sort of stuff. But ultimately, they have control. And if they say no, it's, it's no. It's not even questioned. It's okay, well, let's, do, let's go somewhere else. Or let's do something different. Or what do you want instead? I'm, I'm sort of making it for them. I'm not doing it for me. 
we talked to Ian Jones uh, a few months ago when we were doing our Bad Boy Bubby episode. It really feels like you're a very collaborative filmmaker when it comes to the whole process and being able to take people's ideas and you know kind of run with them. I mean, especially when it comes to something like Bad Boy Bubby, where you have all of the different cinematographers and all these different looks going on with it. It's the best way to work, you know. Uh, it's uh, yeah. For, for me, it's the best way to work. You get the most out of people if you're collaborative. If, if you sort of jump up and down and say, this is what you want, they, you don't give them much, do you? And, 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 you know, they can go into a whole different areas, like the cinematographers, like, like working with the Aboriginal people. They, they do different aspects of the same thing, but even on a much more conventional film. There's a question that, questioning system that I use for myself. And when somebody suggests something or when somebody comes up with something or... When an actor does something uh, that's not quite what you expect, or you know, at any stage, when you're, when you're coming across stuff that you don't, that you haven't thought of, or that you didn't want, or that you didn't expect, I ask myself, you know, is it is it better than what I thought? Is it worse than what I thought? Or is it just different? And most of the time, it's just different, and just as good. No, no different. No better. No worse. Just different. And, and and if it is, then I always go with it because it gives the person who's come up with it, it gives them something, uh, and I don't lose anything. The production as a whole gains as people become more committed and uh, um, you know part of the process of making it, and they they give more. I think one of the most surprising films that you've done, for me anyway, was Doctor Plonk. I was completely. Oh, yeah taken aback by it. I had no idea walking into the, into the theater what it was going to be. And I was so glad I didn't because it just unspooled and I was just sucked right in. Where did that one come from? Well, it was lovely. Um, it was a lovely thing to do. It was a lovely film to make. Uh, um, um, look, it came from having uh, 20,000 feet of old stock that I didn't know what to do with. That's where, that's where it came from. And then suddenly one day I saw it. I saw this old stock, because some of it was like over 10 years old and it had been in the fridge that had broken down and the tins were rusting and you just could imagine the stock being in dreadful shape. And, and suddenly one day I saw this stock unspooling with all the dye things going wrong and, and, and I was seeing a black and white uh, saw movie. Um, and I thought, well, why not? Let's do it. It was a joy to make as well. Uh, and, and, you know, you, you can't make these things like they used to anymore, although in many respects we, we tried. I mean, we ended up with a hand-cranked camera, you know, so everything was hand-cranked like they used to. You know, occupational health and safety has, has <laughs> shifted things quite a lot, and so you've got to be much more careful with stunts and all that sort of business. But uh, uh, still, it was great. There were times when there were just three of us, the, the cranking, the cameraman, the actor and I, and that's all you need. You know, you go because the actors do their own costumes and makeup, and and um, uh, you know, you just walk off somewhere and do something like like they used to do it. Yeah, no, it was great. It was a lovely big film to make. It was great. In, in, the, in the writing, but then working with the actors to to push them further. It was a great shoot because I didn't know how long it was going to take us, and I knew there would be interference with the shoot because of 10 canoes would probably go to Khan and all this sort of business and that was going to be a mess of a shoot. And so I just said, okay, well, six months, that's it, six months. It's going to take us six months because it was crew. Yeah, you know, mainly five people, that was it. And it meant that we could do things like, okay, there was a there was a scene that was written simply by the police chase plonk forward, the police chase plonk. And there was a whole day uh, set aside to do this and I turned up on the day and I said, ah, this is hopeless, okay. You and you, you can go home because it's a small group. There's only two or three people at the centre. And the, the stuntman and, and the actors and I then spent the whole day working out what to shoot and how to shoot it. And we then spent two weeks shooting that sequence you know, the, 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 that had been scheduled for one day. Now, we could do that. Uh, and that's a great liberty and that's not something you can normally do on a film. Yeah, it makes it good. It seems like kind of going back to the beginning of our conversation with the whole idea of the funding and all this kind of stuff. 
who's crazy enough to put their money into a modern day black and white silent film? Yeah, well, it, it was sad, kind of a bit soon, didn't it? Just the one that the one that came a couple of years later made a shitload of money, um, which was the artist, which I haven't seen. Um, uh, and so, in in one sense, it's not such a crazy idea. Some somebody else had the same idea, made a lot of money out of it. This cost a lot less than that did, and that's you know. That's why people are crazy enough, because you think, oh, this could do something, but it's not going to cost a lot to find out. Can you tell me a little bit bit about 12 Canoes? 12 Canoes is not really mine. Um, That's uh, Molly Reynolds. Um, It's uh, it's a website project. You you can go to 12canoes.com.au, and there's a wonderful website there. Um, But central to that website were... 12 sort of more high-end little video stories, about five minutes each or so, that's three to six minutes, I think that. Uh, and the the guy who was the head of the Australian National Film and Sound Archive at the time, he happened to be over and saw, while the editing process was going on, saw two of those segments and he um, he said, look, you know, we're building a new high-end screening facility in Canberra at the National Film and Sound Archive, and I'd like to open it with this stuff, you know, because it's so great. So in the end, we 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 joined the twelve up together, and and they played as one piece. I mean, I didn't direct or produce. I wrote some. I wrote, yeah, I wrote. I did. I did most of the writing for it, and and playing them as one piece, they really worked. It was a strong. It was a you know, it was a strangely immersive thing, and 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 the pace of it is very, a la, you know, Aboriginal community up the, up the top end. Where where the pace is, is of life is is different than you know, time is a different thing, and and the the film reflected that. And it actually went to Telluride and various other places and won all sorts of archaeological film sort of prizes and yeah no it it, it uh, as as did the website in fact so it was a big success uh, to all kinds. It looks like uh, looking at your CV again. It looks like you did a whole lot of documentary shorts in 2008. Were those kind of related to that? I think they must be ascribed to me. They must be the 12 segments of, of 12 canoes. It was like uh, one called Jamming One, Jamming Two, Songman One, Songman Two, The Undertaker, Turtle Hunt. Ah, oh, no. No. Okay. They're even even. They're the low-end video ones on that same Talkin' website. I didn't do them. They're not me. They're, they're, they're all Molly Reynolds, not, not, not me. Can you tell me, how did The King is Dead come about? It came about in two ways. One is I was, I was encouraged by the film funding agency in Australia to apply for some script development money, which is not something I normally do. And for some reason, I said, yes, okay, all right, then I'll do that, okay. And, and what I was going to do was, uh, there was a script I had previously written a long time before, back in early 90s, which had some traction for a while, which was to be shot in America. Miramax owned it at one point, and there's another mob who wanted to do it, and it just never, never actually ended up going. Uh, and I was going to convert it into being Australian. And I tried to do that, and I, um, I failed. It, it, it was intractable. It didn't want to be turned into an Australian film. It didn't work in the same way because the social conditions are different and, and so on. And the distances are different and the population density is different and it just, it just it wasn't going to work. And so I said to the Australian Film Commission, look, I, look, I can't make it work. I'll give you your money back. And I said, no, 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 just do anything else. Anything you want. It doesn't have to be that. It can be anything. Okay, I'll let like I thought about it, and I, I was living in a situation where I had six neighbours, and I was wandering around and thinking, oh, okay, and it, it sort, of, sort of started to come, uh, and all the neighbours I'd ever worked with and, and so on. So I wrote the screenplay, and I liked it, but then it went on the shelf, like many things do, for two or three years. And then uh, suddenly the opportunity came to make a film. Uh, there was a gap in, in time, 
we were going to sell our house because we were going to move to Tasmania. And I thought, oh, if we, we, we can do this here. You know, we can do it with the neighbours, with you know, George on one side and Sam and Anna on the other side and, and cut a hole in the fence, no worries, and it's all, all will work. And we, there's three houses next to each other like, the, like they are in the film. And so we did. So that's how that came about. So a film of opportunity, kind of. Yeah, yeah. Did you go right from that into Charlie's Country? Within within six weeks of finishing the mix, or six, eight, eight, say ten. Within ten weeks of finishing the mix of of the the sound mix of um, King is Dead, uh, I'd committed to David that we would be doing Charlie's Country, and began to work on it full time. So yes, it was a pretty quick turnover. Now that one's credited to you and David for writing that. Had, had you done a lot of uh, collaborative writing at that point? In terms of writing, uh, it's uh, look, it's collaborative in the way that Ten Coons is collaborative in the writing, except that, you know who, who puts the words on the page. I do, and in that sense, it's not okay. It's not two people running around with each other writing together. That's not how that works with David, but. I had been, you know, I, I had several times before made a film to suit somebody else rather than myself. You know, Ten Canoes was a film that suited the mob rather than me. Uh, Dance Me to My Song was a film that was effectively made for Heather Rose and the way she wanted it to be. And we all felt we were making a film for, we, we, we were being the the means by which she could make a film. So I'd had experience of doing that before. And and that's what Charlie's Country became. Yes, there's a lot of my ideas in it. And I don't know which ones are mine and which ones are David's and, and so on. But it's as much made for what David would want it to be as it is for anything else. That one seems to have gotten a lot of praise um, as it's been going through the festival circuit and playing different places. Yes, it's... it's um, it's I, I've now seen it in many countries of the world with audiences and done Q&As and things. And it plays very well. It, it, it gets a response almost everywhere that's much the same. Uh, even though culturally, there are different things that attract different audiences, but the, the, the response of being moved and interested by it are the same. Um, so, yes, no, it's been, it's been a great and glorious journey. What was it like to kind of come back and work with David after all these years? Look, it was such a, an individual and a particular situation, that one, that... What's it like? It's very different because David had given up drinking, uh, and so the issues were all different. Um, we we had gotten to know each other a lot better uh, um, over the years, and it was yeah as much as possible as his film yeah to make him feel that it's his film because that was important. Those, those issues, okay, the fact that David had been in jail when when I began to talk to him about doing it. And and for alcoholism and so on, and 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 that that um, well, actually in jail for violence linked to alcoholism. Let's put it that way. But so that the, the the film played a very different part in his life. It was very important to him. It was like his it was his redemption. And so all the weights on it were very different. It was a very different process. Uh, and also to be making a film with David in Darwin and Raman Ginning, which are for him about the two most difficult places in the world to make a film. Uh, because the the obligations that are upon him are huge, um, that made things also quite interesting compared compared to before. Um, very different process, but but look, it was uh, in both the films that he's he starred in that I've done with him. He's, he's fantastic in the films. So it's a good process. Uh, there must be something right about it. Let's put it that way. You said that a lot of the films that you've made have been kind of for other people. What do you consider kind oh, of the few. ones? Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, if I said a lot, I meant a few. Yeah. What are some of the ones that you consider yours, and what are the favorites of those? Bobby's mine, in a way, for me, very much. It's a very, the first film that's truly for me, although although Tale of Tiger in its own way was, but that was sort of so, so to fill a hole in a particular way. So Bobby was the first one, Epsilon, very much so, Quiet Room, very much so. Oddly, The Old Man Who Read Love Stories, that was based on a novel, uh, is in some ways pretty representative of who I am. Yeah, Plonk was for me. Yeah, what are my favourites? I don't, I don't, I don't look at them that way. 
I love them all. And and look, you know, I've been most privileged to have made a number of films that have had serious, interesting traction. And, and, and you know, you think to have made one film like Ten Canoes would have been, you know, extraordinary in a life of making films. But, but you know, it was just, it was Ten Canoes and there was Bad Boy Bubby and, and now there's Charlie's Country and there was The Tracker and Quiet Room and Bash into the Song. They both went to Khan in competition. It was like, Whoa, whoa, whoa. One after another. It was just been incredible. It's been incredible. So I know you're traveling around Europe for a while and now you're back in Australia. Are you working on the next one yet or just kind of thinking about it? Uh, just kind of thinking about it. And I've got a trip to the US coming up in uh, less than four weeks because the film Charlie's Country is, is going to make us a bit of a theatrical um, appearance in the States. Stuff in the States for it. Well, hey, thank you so much for your time. This has been great talking to you. I've really enjoyed it. Okay, Mike. Thank you. And uh, all the best of it all. back and we're talking about 10 canoes thanks to mr jones and mr de for coming on and taking the time to talk to us and of course joined by our special guest co-host this week miguel rodriguez so gentlemen you did talk a little bit about ralph de and sort of your experiences with him uh, what other films have you seen recently of his and uh, which ones have had a serious impact on you you guys have been killing me this whole time because i have not seen bad boy bubby and I want to oh, desperately see it now. <laughs> no, no, it's great. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad because uh, I'm always happy to get a recommendation of a film I haven't seen. And I, I want to throw this puppy on as soon as we're, we're done talking. It's not the easiest watch in the world because there's, um, there's like a slight bit of violence against a cat. And I know that freaks Americans out a lot. And so some people end up talking about this that movie in terms of a dead cat rather than looking at the entire film. And there's a lot more going on than that one scene. So it's a fantastic film. And the way that it was shot, the story behind the way that it was shot, makes it even more fascinating. Well, the other thing about it is, too, is, and we talked about this on the show, so hopefully we get a chance to watch it and then maybe you'll listen to the episode is that the first kind of 20 minutes have this sort of really dark, um, at least for me when I was watching it, I thought this was like one of those French brutalist films from the, from the 90s. You know what I'm talking about? Like that mm-hmm. whole era of just really dark stuff. I mean, like the opening just kind of reminded me of maybe like the opening of, I think I talked about I Stand Alone about the guy who's the butcher who has this incestuous relationship with his daughter and like everybody dies in the end. And it's that first it just, Gaspar Noy film. Yeah, and right. it totally looks like that. Like it's it's shot in this little room and it's really bleak. And then it turns the corner on you and you're like, What? <laughs> and, and it's uh it takes a minute to get used to that turn, but you're you you'll be happy for it. Yeah, thank you for the the film recommendation. I, I had no idea this film really existed, so I'm always thrilled to get a new film recommendation. Yeah, and I really, I mean, I have yet to see a De Hare film that I dislike. You know, everything that I've seen of his is memorable and striking in some way. Even if it's something like, you know, like a dark comedy like The King is Dead, it's not just a dark comedy. You know, there's a lot more stuff going to it. He really kind of, he makes you realize that there's a lot of stuff happening in the film, even though he's not going to beat you over the head with it, which I appreciate. But, I, I mean, I always go back to Dr. Plonk, which was his 2007 film, which I cannot recommend enough. It is a silent movie, basically shot as if it was made in the 1920s, I think it was, or maybe 1915. So it's shot like with an old camera and talking about how this guy is going to go 100 years into the future. And obviously we were living in that 
time when you know he is going to go into this future world. So to hear him talk about you know, going – well, and he doesn't talk. It's all with intertitles and everything. This very much is a silent film. And there's a lot of great kind of slapstick stuff. There's a lot of great visual jokes. It's a really good silent comedy shot in 2007 – about a guy in 1907. So it, it, there's a lot of funny layers again going on with this thing. Have you seen any other of De Hare's work, Miguel? Um, I don't. I don't think so. I think Ten Canoes is my one De Hare film. I also have to recommend The Tracker, which is another movie that he made with David Gilpolo. Mm-hmm. And I haven't seen Charlie's, what is it, Charlie's Country, the one that he did in 2013, which is supposed to be fantastic, but I have yet to check that one out, and I'm really looking forward to that. I think that's he's still showing it around on the festival circuit. Maybe that's finally coming to a close. Luckily, David Gopalel is getting a lot of notice from that, just from his performance. He also helped co-write, or at least he has a co-writing screenplay on that. I think it was more of a collaboration between those two guys, because Gopalel as I'm sure we all know on this podcast, has been working in film since the early 70s. You know, He was the black boy in Walkabout. So you know, he's there, I think he was in his teens when he made that movie. And the reason why I call him the Black Boy is that's his character's name in there, or at least in the credits when that comes up. He's been in front of a camera for all of these years. I think that De Hare is the guy that worked with him the most of, of all directors, but he has been in so many different films. I want to say he was even in, um, cause he was in like the, the rabbit proof fence, mm-hmm. uh, crocodile Dundee for God's sakes. He, yeah, he makes a, an appearance in the proposition, which is another film I recommend though, not a De Hare film. So, and God, I think he was even in a, uh, like a like a Beastmaster uh, TV episode. So this guy's been around for a long time and doing a lot of interesting work. And he's kind of your go-to for that kind of role, I suppose. For which kind of role? For being the Aboriginal? Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think he is like the face of Australian Aboriginals. I don't know what he would say about something like that because – To Rob's point earlier, it is kind of like, um, you know, it's a hot button topic after all these years still. I think it kind of comes in waves. And it's always fascinating to me to talk to filmmakers or people from Australia as far as their perception of Aboriginals, because that's probably so different for them than for people like us sitting here and talking about this movie where we have, you know, it's, it's another world. I don't think any of us on this podcast have been to Australia and we definitely don't have, you know, 300 years of history to talk about when it comes to the white man's interactions with the abos. Yeah. A lot of it, very ugly interactions as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that if you can make it through Rabbit Proof Fence without crying, um, I think you need to have your heart checked. Yeah, you're a jerk. So we covered Bad Boy Bubby, and it was a matter of, like, I want to cover another Ralph the Hare film. And when we were going around about this, it was like, which one is it going to be? Because he does offer up so many great films to talk about. And it really was, for me, between Dr. Plonk and Ten Canoes, because... You know, you really can't get two different films when it comes to the subject matter of these movies. And Ten Canoes ended up winning out just because of that whole idea of the aboriginals and everything. But really, he just offers a wealth of great movies to look at. And I'm hoping, like, I I think for folks like us, he's kind of recognized as being a great filmmaker. But obviously, he's not a household name. I mean, I, I can't say how much I appreciate you asking me to uh, discuss Ten Canoes because this is going to be one of those thing, things where I uh, just have a Rolf de Hare marathon. And uh, I really want to introduce myself to these films and uh, and maybe one day introduce other people to them as well. This is This is golden right here. All right, we're going to take another break and play a preview for next week's show.
For the first time in screen history, a special interval will be provided during the running of this picture for refunding your admission. If you're unable to stand the almost unbearable suspense, the almost paralyzing shock of homicidal... Homicide is your hobby. Uh, may I recommend a surgical knife for a nice, clean, quiet murder? I'm William Castle, and uh, uh, this wheelchair is just to rest my tired nerves after producing a picture like this one. We are so sure you will find it such a shocking and startling experience that we are offering a money-back guarantee when you come to see homicidal. At the height of the suspense, there will be a fright break, an interval during which you can quiet your nerves. If you are too frightened to see the end of the picture, your full admission price will be refunded. Time to go downstairs now. Got a date to carve a corpse. That's right, we're back next week. Kick off Shocktober month. It's William Castle's Homicidal. We'll be joined again by our good friend Jeffrey Swartz, who will be talking about this Fright Fest. And uh, make sure you get that insurance policy up to date. Before we go, I want to thank this week's special guest co host, Miguel Rodriguez. Now, Miguel, you were just wrapping up your film festival. How did everything go, sir? Um, it was definitely our most successful year yet, both in terms of attendance and uh, how much money we have left over to put toward next year. And the feedback we've gotten from both filmmakers and the audience has all been, uh, to, to be perfectly honest with you, overwhelming. I, I get um, a little teary-eyed because uh, my emotions are on overdrive after all the year of planning for this one this is definitely the year i've worked the hardest on the film festival and and to have it come together uh so well in our new location and in this i don't know if you've seen pictures of it on facebook or anything but we were at uh the museum of photographic arts in balboa park which is a museum it's in a park so it's a very unique location and while that poses some problems it also gives a very uh magical setting for uh, especially a horror film festival when you know when, when it's nighttime and we're leaving the theater at 11 p.m. the park is technically closed but they light up all these a uh, hundred year old mission style, very grandiose buildings with this stark blue light. It, it's surreal. Anyway, I, I think it went off very well with, you know, some minor, minor technical problems that happen at every film festival, but everybody was very happy and, uh, it gets, just gets me planning for next year. I, I'm afraid to say. <laughs> I see that you showed uh, Della Mori Della Morte at the festival this year. On 35 millimeter. God, that is such a wonderful film. Yeah. Um, and the, the beauty of that, whenever I do the repertory, because so at my film festival, I always do uh, newer independent, but I also have repertory because my mission statement is to um, showcase the variety that can, and, and uh, also to, um, elevate the perception that can be uh, geared or thrown at the horror genre. And you, you can't really elevate or explore the genre without looking at the roots, right? You need to see what came before. You need to look at some classic films. And so uh, this year I chose De la Morte de la More as one of my repertory. And because I was at the museum, they have a dual projector uh, changeover system. And uh, UCLA, Film and Television Archive, was kind enough to loan me their print uh, for a 35-millimeter screening. And it looked 
jaw droppingly gorgeous. <laughs> The director of that is another guy whose work I need to look at a little bit more as well, because he's done some interesting things, too. I mean, Delamore, Delamorte, that was one of those weird ones where I couldn't believe that that got an American release under the name Cemetery Man, but I couldn't believe that it was showing at mainstream theaters. Like, I remember seeing that at the UA um, Oakland Mall, Oakland um yeah, it's Oakland Mall, right? And just like, what? Why is this here? And then that is this outrageous Italian zombie comedy. It's like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, it's strange that it got that kind of release. It's kind of like I build it on the program as, as a kind of being the swan song of the Italian art house horror film, you know, mm-hmm. in the vein of your your Argentos or your Fulci's or, 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 or Bava's or what have you. Uh, it, it's it's kind of the last of that era before the nineties kind of put an end to that. And in a lot of ways it's, it's an apex of quality too. It's really something special. And when I asked the audience um, who had never seen it before, there was a lot of hands going up. So uh, every time I do that, I get this thrill that is just in the pit of my stomach that there's all these people who are putting up their hands, who are their first experience with De La Morte, De La More is going to be on a big, gorgeous screen in 35 millimeter. And uh, th- there's just no better way. I'm also happy to say that on Sunday, my other repertory film, also on 35 millimeter, was Edgar G. Ulmer's Bluebeard. Um, and uh, we had a panel discussion on the life of Edgar Ulmer just preceding that that screening with uh, Ulmer's daughter, Ariane Ulmer, in attendance, and his biographer, Noah Eisenberg, who I believe you recently had on the podcast. Yes, he's been on for both our Detour and our Black Cat episodes. I listened to both of them. They're great episodes. How did the screening of uh, Bluebeard go over? I would have loved to have seen that in 35. It was, it was amazing. And, you know, I, I fostered an audience over the last six years of – um, of of connoisseurs of the genre who are also willing to take chances and um, and dip their toes into something new, and we you know we've done classic repertory for a long time now, so uh, so this was not something unexpected of me, and everybody loved it, and everybody was coming up to Ariane afterward, saying that only two people two people in the audience had seen Bluebeard before. And it was, you know, it, it, there were probably about 140 for Bluebeard. So, um, wow. Yeah. And so to have like 138 see Bluebeard for the first time on this rare 35 millimeter print, which was loaned to me by the Academy, um, is, is really a, a, a beautiful thing because Bluebeard has been public domain for a while. And as you know, when these titles go into the public domain, they're available on a billion different DVDs, and they look god awful. And uh, and I mean, John Carradine's voice and his and his eyes deserve to be seen in in a restored glory. And uh, and the print looked really really good, and the panel went off really well. In fact, uh, anyone who wants to listen to the panel with Ariane and Noah, we did um, make a podcast of it. That one is for uh, is posted. And it's available now, actually, on um, my partner, Beth Accomando, the part, my partner in the Film Geeks, um, uh, Beth Accomando. She runs the Cinema Junkie. She's our local radio, uh, NPR affiliate radio station's arts and culture reporter. She has a podcast called Cinema Junkie, and uh, she recorded the panel and posted it on her podcast yesterday. So anyone should go to uh, kpbs.org slash Cinema Junkie to listen to that, like, right now. <laughs> Well, very cool. We'll definitely throw a link to that over at our website, projection-boot.com, as well as a link over to the Horrible Imaginings Film Festival website so people can go and check out the program. Is there anything that you showed this year that we should be on the lookout for as far as a feature or a short horror film that we should definitely uh, have our radar going for? 
I got to be honest with you, there's a ton. Um, I showed, uh, including the repertory, I think I showed something like nine feature films and 67 short films. But wow. let me let me boil it down to, uh, I could name some of the winners, for example. Um, I want to I wanna mention Bunny, which is a 30-minute short film from the UK um, that uh, is just an exercise in subtlety and uh and haunting thriller while also delivering us a a villain that is worthy of like a uh a carl bohm from peeping tom you know uh only she's um a female there's this woman in it who uh who is a sympathetic villain and and the way that uh, that the director Adam Ani crafted the film Bunny, I just adore. I think it's a wonderful film. And in fact, when we showed it, I will, I'm not afraid to say, like I had a tear running down my face as the the credits started rolling, and I had to go up to the stage to because uh, I closed that block with it. Um, I recommend The Smiling Man, also uh, from. Um, A.J. Briones, which took home our best monster show short. Uh, it's a uh, six-minute short film, very terrifying, starring a uh, – I think she's about a six-year-old girl meeting a uh, the, the embodiment of evil in her kitchen. And that went over really well. It's, it's a really incredible short. Of course, uh, there's a short that's um, – hitting the the waves pretty hard called El Gigante by a filmmaker named Gigi Sol Guerrero and she's um becoming kind of a next big thing kind of thing going on uh but her short was very popular and it's a lot of fun about a uh basically a luchador version of of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre family um and in, as far as uh, features go, uh, we had a film called Valley of the Sasquatch, which is always fun, starring uh, Bill Oberst Jr. But the one that really was a crowd pleaser was an LGBT or a gay slasher movie uh, called You're Killing Me by a director named Jim Hansen. And it's a horror comedy. And the uh, the horror stuff is, is pretty fun, but the, the comedy is just, dare I say, killer. Those are just a few, but definitely check out the program because I got to say I'm 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 exceedingly proud of the program we put together this year. It was it was just stellar. There's so many good films that uh, I highly recommend them. Very cool. Well, thanks again, Miguel, for coming on the show. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, and thanks to everybody for listening. You know, if you want to go over, we have delved into the world of Patreon. So we have a Patreon link over at our website. You can go over there, click on that, give us a couple bucks, feel better about yourself. We're actually getting close to being funded for at least one month. So wouldn't that be nice? That would uh, really help uh, take some pressure off of us. So that would be fantastic. So one month, it's a twelfth of the way there. It's definitely a start. So for now, it is time for all of us to swim back to our water holes.
If you enjoy this show and want more people to know about it, head on over to iTunes, leave a comment, and rate it five stars. Make sure you like and share us on Facebook, and don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Just search for Christopher Media. Thank you in advance for supporting Christopher Media by clicking on the PayPal button and by clicking through to all the sponsors who support ChristopherMedia.net. Most importantly, we would like to take the time to extend an extra special thanks to you. Christopher Media could not exist without your support. Thank you for visiting ChristopherMedia.net, and thank you for listening. Christopher Media, let's make some noise.